Welcome to Physics Next Book. In this video, we shall discuss the true nature of energy and momentum in a way that goes beyond the purview of Newtonian mechanics. But to get to that, we need to quickly remind ourselves how the idea of momentum and energy came about in elementary Newtonian mechanics, starting with momentum. If this seems trivial to you, just ask yourselves, how do I know that for a moving particle, its mass times velocity is an important quantity that we must keep track of. We do not care about m squared v or v by m and so on. What is so special about m times v? If you already know the answer, great, put it down in the comment section. In case you don't, here is why. When some force is applied to an object, all we see is it changes velocity with time or accelerate. Moreover, for a given applied force, heavier objects undergo lesser acceleration and lighter objects accelerate more. These observations led Newton to his second law of motion quantifying force as mass times acceleration or m dv dt. Now if the mass of the particle is fixed, which is usually the case, we can write the m dv dt as ddt of mass times velocity. So, if there is no force to act on the particle, ddt of m times v is zero, which means the product of its mass and velocity does not change as time passes. This is a very general rule about some quantity remaining a constant in time under a certain condition. Such rules are called conservation laws and they help us set up mathematical equations to solve problems in physics. This is why the product of particles mass and velocity is important, since it appears in a conservation law. We name it the momentum of the particle and use the symbol p for it. There is more to the momentum story of course, but to continue that, we need to talk about energy and how it came into Newtonian mechanics. Let's consider a specific type of force that depends only on the position of the object on which the force is being applied. If this force makes the object move an infinitesimal distance dx, we say the dot product of f and dx is the amount of work done on the object by the applied force. Let's make the y and z coordinates invisible to make the math look a bit simpler. But there is the vector sign to remind ourselves that we are actually dealing with three dimensions. Alright, so if the object is pushed from some initial location x initial to some final location x final, the total work done on it is the integral of f dot dx with x initial and x final as the integration limits. Now using the second law in the integral, we can write f dot dx as m dv dt dotted with dx which is same as m dv dot dx dt. In physics, we often take such liberties with infinitesimals. Since dx dt is v itself, this way we can convert the f dot dx integral into m v dv, an integral over the velocity. Now under any applied force, the object either accelerates or decelerates, so its velocity must change from some initial value v initial that it had when the force started to act on it or we started to observe it, to a final value v final when the force was withdrawn or we stopped observing. Naturally, the limits of this velocity integral are these initial and final velocity values. Upon integration, we see that the net amount of work done is the difference between half m v final squared and half m v initial squared. Ok, so far so good. Now comes a little party trick. We bring in an arbitrary reference location point x reference and break the work done integral f dot dx into two parts. An integral f dot dx from x initial to x reference plus another from x reference to x final. We can choose this x reference as per our convenience when dealing with a particular physical problem. What this does is, now we can write these two integrals as a function v of x evaluated at the two terminal locations x initial and x final. This function v of x for any location x is defined as the integral of f dot dx from the chosen reference location x reference to x, with a minus in front. Physically, it signifies the work needed to push the object from the reference location x reference to the location x against the force. 
f dot dx is the work done by the force, right? So minus f dot dx means work done against the force. It is crucial to realize that we can define such a function v of x depending purely on the position variable because we began with a force f that depended only on the position variable. By the way, do remember that x here symbolically represents all three position coordinates in three dimensions. So the work done integral is now v of x initial minus v of x final and it equals half m times final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. Rearranging the terms so that the left side depends on the initial position and velocity and the right side on the final ones, we see that both sides have the same structure half m v squared plus v of x. Okay, so due to the application of force, the object moves from the initial location to the final location and its velocity changes from the initial value to the final value. So both the position and the velocity of the object change. But somehow the value of this quantity half m v squared plus v of x as a whole with the initial position and velocity is the same as its value with the final position and velocity. Can it be the same only at the initial and final points and something else in between? Not really, because the initial and final positions and velocities have nothing special. Whenever we start and stop observing, the corresponding position and velocity values are the terminal ones. So at every point on the trajectory, this quantity half mv squared plus v of x needs to keep itself the same. Means it is a constant in time, a conserved quantity. We call it the mechanical energy E of the system. The conservation law for the mechanical energy goes like, if the force applied on the object depends only on the position of the object, then its mechanical energy is conserved. This type of forces are called conservative forces and they are very common in physics. For example, Earth's gravitational pull on the object is one such example. A charged particle attracted or repelled by another charged particle is another example a mass oscillating under a spring action, there are so many examples like this. You can see that the mechanical energy of the object has two parts. One related to the motion of the object given by the velocity squared term, this is called the kinetic energy T, and the other the function V of x depending only on the position of the object and it is called the potential energy. To summarize what we have so far, when a force applies to the object its velocity changes due to acceleration or deceleration, thereby changing its kinetic energy or energy related to its motion. At the same time, the change of location of the object due to the work done by the force or against the force also causes its potential energy to change. If the force happens to be the conservative one, the kinetic and potential energy change to compensate each other such that their sum total remains a constant in time. Now, let's go back to the integral equation defining the potential energy function v of x. We can easily convert it to a differential form as f equals minus del v del x or negative gradient of the potential energy if you prefer the proper three-dimensional vector notation. This differential relation means that the origin of the conservative force acting on the object actually lies in the change of the potential energy of the object as it changes location. So, if the potential energy V of x happens to be uniform, that is, has a constant value at every spatial location, then the force, being the space derivative of V and all, is zero. And we already know from the Newton's second law, or the force equation, or the equation of motion of the system, whatever you may want to call it, what zero applied force means. The momentum is conserved. So, we see, if an object has uniform potential energy across all space points, its equation of motion or dynamics ensures that its momentum is conserved. What's the big deal in this statement? The big deal is uniform potential energy of an object across all space means for that object any location of space is like every other location. All locations are identical for it and thus it perceives space as an homogeneous entity. So we may say if for a system space is homogeneous the momentum of that system is conserved. This gives us a way to generalize the definition of momentum beyond the p equals mass times velocity of Newtonian mechanics. We can say, for a given system, its momentum is that property 
whose conservation is ensured by the homogeneity of space. What the hell? What good is this definition? At least the simple p equals m times v was a mathematical equation we could use. This one sounds like, you know, word salad. Well, not really. We can get a mathematical definition out of these two. Let's see how. When we say for a physical system, space is homogeneous, it is a statement about the symmetry of that system. Something that helps us construct the mathematical model of that system. Basically, we get a hint about the Lagrangian of the system. Since for the system, all locations of the space is the same, the Lagrangian L of that system cannot depend on the space coordinates. So homogeneity of space means del L del X is equal to zero for the system. We are using partial derivatives because along with x, there are also the y and z coordinates which we are not showing explicitly. If you do not know what a Lagrangian is, refer to the video in the i cards. In that video, we introduced the Lagrangian for a mechanical system and obtained a generic form of the Lagrange's equation, which dictates the time evolution of any mechanical system. We just insert the specific Lagrangian of a system in this equation to obtain the system's equation of motion. Anyway, the generic form of this Lagrange's equation tells us that del L del X is equal to ddt of del L del X dot. X dot is just a shorthand notation for writing dx dt, the velocity by the way. So we have homogeneity making del L del X zero and that together with the equation of motion of the system make ddt of del L del X dot equal to zero, meaning del L del X dot is conserved. Thus, homogeneity makes del L del X dot a conserved quantity. But we already know homogeneity ensures conservation of momentum. We just discussed this before. So del L del X dot must be the X component of the momentum vector. For the Y and Z components, extending the definition is trivial. Thus, using the symmetry statement and the equation of motion, we have got ourselves a general definition of momentum of a system in terms of its Lagrangian. Why is this general definition important? Because of its applicability to systems which are beyond the scope of Newtonian mechanics. Newton's laws of motion can only tell us how massive objects behave under a given force. But Lagrangian mechanics provides an algorithm that not only applies to massive and massless objects, but can also be generalized to accommodate fields like the electric and magnetic and gravitational fields, etc. So from the Lagrangian of these fields, we can find out their momentum, even though they do not have mass, so to speak. And momentum of these fields play a crucial role in their quantization. So you see, Without the general definition of momentum that we have just discussed, we wouldn't have theories like quantum electrodynamics, quantum chromodynamics and so on. Okay, so we have seen that conservation of momentum follows from a symmetry, the homogeneity of space. A symmetry that has implications on the Lagrangian of a system. But we have come across another conserved quantity in this video itself, the mechanical energy of an object under a conservative force. Does this mean energy conservation also follows from some kind of symmetry? Let's think it through. Energy conservation holds when the system is under a conservative force, which we know is a function of position coordinates only. So there is no time dependence in the force. This means the system feels the force exactly the same way today as it felt yesterday, as it will feel tomorrow and the day after and so on. So for this system, time is homogeneous and homogeneity of time being a symmetry statement should make the mechanical energy of the system conserved. To say this, let's address how the homogeneity of time affects the Lagrangian of the system. It should not have any explicit time dependence. The implicit time dependence must be there though through the position and velocity because we know that Lagrangian depends on position and velocity variables and they are of course functions of time. So, while the partial derivative of the Lagrangian del L del T is zero, the total time derivative dl dt is not. This information about the Lagrangian of the system will help us obtain a mathematical definition for the energy of the system in terms of its Lagrangian. 
like the generic definition of momentum we did earlier this definition of energy will also work for systems which are beyond the scope of newtonian mechanics let's see the total derivative of the lagrangian with time in general should have contributions of three kinds change of the lagrangian due to the change of position with time that is del l del x times ddt of x plus change of the lagrangian due to the change of velocity x dot with time that is del l del x dot times ddt of x dot and finally change of the lagrangian due to the change of time itself that is del l del t this is simply the chain rule of partial derivatives taught in elementary calculus with homogeneity of time this last term del l del t is zero So for a system where the applied force is conservative and therefore time is homogeneous the total time rate of change of the lagrangian or dl dt has contributions only from the time rate of change of position and time rate of change of velocity let's replace dx dt by x dot the shorthand notation we have been using now employing the lagrange's equation we can replace the del l del x with d dt of del l del x dot This lets us write the whole of the right hand side as a total time derivative ddt over del l del x dot times x dot. So the total time derivative of l equals a total time derivative of del l del x dot times x dot. It is quite obvious now what we need to do to make this equation look like a conservation law. We bring everything over to one side to write ddt of del l del x dot times x dot minus l equals zero. which makes del l del x dot times x dot minus l the conserved quantity connected to the symmetry of homogeneity of time but we have already discussed that homogeneity of time makes mechanical energy the conserved quantity so that entity del l del x dot times x dot minus l must be the definition of energy of the system in terms of its lagrangian so hopefully now you understand what energy and momentum really are They hold important places in physics since they appear in conservation laws which give us additional information that we can use to analyze the system. Before we wrap it up, let me point out that we have not shown here that these general definitions of energy and momentum indeed produce the expressions of momentum and energy that we are familiar with. Let's cover that in the next video. Hopefully this one has been worth the watch. You can find more on the basics of Lagrangian mechanics and the action principle by clicking the video links on the screen. Thanks for your time. Bye bye.